technology has enabled me to build a practice that I can literally run from anywhere in the world. And that was important to me. So like that was that was my guiding mission was that I'm gonna build an accounting firm that I can run from anywhere in the world. Hello everyone, welcome to Life and Accounting, a podcast production of where accountants go. I'm Mark Goldman, your host for this podcast and a CPA myself. We are a show that is all about accounting careers. We talk about what it takes to start your accounting career. We talk about what it takes to progress in your accounting career. But specifically, we try to cover all the different career paths that are available to you when you have a background in accounting. Well, our guest for this week is Amanda Aguilard. Amanda is the owner of three businesses, the first of which she decided to start after returning to the workforce from being a stay-at-home mom for seven years. She found it necessary to return to work, but she didn't want to sacrifice the time that she had been able to spend with her kids as they continued to grow up. So she founded her own business and did accounting services on her terms. That business is Aguilard Accounting. Since then, she started a training company that she's very passionate about as well, Elephant, and a consulting firm that works on larger accounting firms on their technology integration called Blue Wire Strategies. She has a lot going on, but she structured it so that she has the freedom to determine both how and when the work is done, allowing her to keep the flexibility to raise her family as she wants. It's really a tremendous story. If you find value in this for yourself, please check us out online as well. Our website is whereaccountantsgo.com. We have a lot of career-related material for accountants on that site. If you happen to be an employer, one publication that may interest you is Hiring for Accounting. It's a 45-page comprehensive ebook available to help you successfully and efficiently fill accounting positions. And once again, that can be found on our website at whereaccountantsgo.com. Well, I'm really excited to bring this interview to you. So let's go ahead and get started. Here's Amanda Aguilard. Well, hello, Amanda. Welcome to the show. Hey, Mark. How are you? I am doing great. Thank you for joining us today. Happy to be here. Well, for the audience, I come across our guests for the show in many ways. After two and a half years now, many are suggested by other guests, of course, and we really appreciate that. Several are suggested by the audience, you, the audience, and that is definitely a blessing. And then sometimes I come across something online that just piques my interest, and I can't help but reach out and see if that person would come on the show. And that's how I came across our guest for today, Amanda Aguilard. Amanda is a very accomplished accountant entrepreneur, and the businesses she's involved in are related to accounting, but maybe a little more outside the box than you would expect. And what really piqued my interest, actually, was that she has this line on LinkedIn that was very transparent and direct in describing her own life. It simply says, running three businesses, raising two kids. I just love that. (laughs) We have so many discussions about balance on this show, Amanda. I just figured that would be one additional area where you could add some value for our audience. So this is going to be fun. Before we get into all the you know, things you've got going on now, I do always like to start at the beginning so the audience gets an idea of, of how you got to where you are today and where you came from. What initially led you to think about pursuing accounting as a potential career in the first place? Well, I think that the first time I, I learned of accounting as a career was a friend in high school whose mother was, was a CPA. And so I started to just learn a little bit about accounting. And I was, this is probably when I was 15 or 16 years old. And my high school, which is a big public high school in Lafayette, Louisiana, offered accounting as an elective. So my senior year of high school, I took accounting and really never looked back. I loved it. I loved the organization behind it. I did really well. I went to state rally in accounting, so that's kind of a a nerdy distinguishment, but I really did. And I started college in accounting and never wavered, never changed my major from accounting. 
state rally? Is that sort of a, a competition, UIL yeah. competition or something? Yeah, it's a competition at the high school level where students go and compete via written tests on all the subjects that are offered across the, the high school curriculum. So it could be history, it could be English. I went in accounting. And so I made it to second place in state. I did not win state, but I was a second place finisher in the state of Louisiana in 1993. <laughs> Congratulations. You probably still have the ribbon there somewhere, right? <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Actually, it's interesting. About half our guests made the decision in high school. It's, it's almost evenly split, that and college. Really? So, That's funny. Yeah. yeah. Not that unusual. So what were your first few jobs like? What were some of the milestones in your, your early career? During college, I would work the summers at accounting firms. So this is, again, back in the mid-90s, I worked a few small to regional-sized practice jobs as a staff accountant. And I can remember very clearly, like, one of my duties was to collect the bank statements from the mail, you know, as they came in around the third or fourth of the month to get the client's check stubs. There are probably people out there that have clients that are still using this, but to me it seems so archaic to get the client's check stubs that came in the, you know, the binder check stubs and to match and to do write-up work in a very, I don't even remember what, what platform it was, but a very like DOS-based sort of accounting software. And that was one of my jobs over the summer. And then after college, I ended up going to get my master's at the University of Denver. So I moved from South Louisiana to Denver, and at that point, um, we were, that class, we were, um, this was my master's in taxation, so uh, there were all the big four were looking at us, and I ended up with Deloitte and Touche, back when it was Deloitte and Touche, and started in the Denver office, actually, in their tax department for a little over a year, but got kind of homesick, and so wanted to come back to Louisiana, and I got a transfer with Deloitte and transferred down to the New Orleans office, so that's that's how I ended up back in New Orleans, was via Deloitte and through the Denver office. Okay. How long did you stay with Deloitte? I was at Deloitte for a couple of years and then okay. left there to uh, take a job as a corporate controller um, at a company here in New Orleans and did that for five years and then had my first child, my daughter, and then had my son. <laughs> I'm laughing because <laughs> it was only 15 months later that I had my son. And so at that point, I knew that having two babies was, it was going to make working at that level really hard. And so I stopped working. Okay. How long were you, what's the right working term? Working as a, uh, right. yeah. Stay at home mom. <laughs> right. Stay at home mom. Every now and then I would dabble in a little bit of tax season help. I had a friend that was that a tax practice. So I'd go okay. in and work for about six weeks a year, just on a contract basis. But, I mean, honestly, it was when I got divorced. I got divorced in 2012 and it was like, at that point, the kids were seven and eight. Like, all right, well, I'm going to have to go back to work at some point. I don't want to go back to the environment that I knew as the accounting industry. I didn't want to go back to a big four, you know, working 60 hours a week and a lot of travel. And I, even at the corporate industry level, like, I just didn't want to you know, stay overnights on month-end clothes. It just wasn't the lifestyle that I wanted for these kids. I mean, we were all going through this huge transition in our lives, and I wanted to be available to them. And so this is 2012, which is really the beginning of the cloud, of what the cloud is now, right? There was always, you know, for the 10, 15 years before that, there was cloud as far as it being, you know, like remote-hosted desktop or storage of data. But 2012 was really the beginning of working on browser-based software. And so uh, I went to the uh, Louisiana Society of CPAs tech conference and sat through a survey of small business accounting software. And they spent probably 45 minutes talking about QuickBooks Online. And then <laughs> towards the end of the hour, the presenter said, well, there's this new product out of New Zealand called Zero with an X. And it's pretty neat. Let me show you a couple of features in it in the last 10 minutes of this, you know, hour-long CPE. And so he showed us just a couple of cool things in Zero, And I was like, that is awesome. That's what I want. And I ended up building an entire practice on Zero starting in 2012. Wow. From the time you stopped working full-time as a controller mm -hmm. to 2012, I mean, what, how many years are we talking about here? About seven, six or seven years. 
No, yeah. So when I came back into the workforce, knowing that I didn't want to have a, a traditional accounting job, I wanted to be available to my kids. I just you know, looked around for the tools, which really weren't great in 2012. If anybody out there you know, remembers QuickBooks Online from that era, it was awful. It was terrible. People hated it. Um, and it wasn't really until Zero came into the marketplace and gave them some legitimate competition that they started to improve, improve their product. But yeah, but that was the beginning of open APIs and, and all the cool stuff that we're seeing we kind of take for granted now. That really didn't exist until around 2013. You know, and that technology has enabled me to build a practice that I can literally run from anywhere in the world. And that was important to me. So, like, that was my guiding mission was that I'm going to build an accounting firm that I can run from anywhere in the world. In my head, I was like, oh, I'll take the kids to Europe for, you know, the summers and we'll do all stuff. But in reality, it's more like, you know, kids field trips and soccer games out of town and somebody on my lap throwing up and I have to work out of the, the kitchen, you know, like it's not as glamorous as I really thought, but the underwiring is all the same, the, the infrastructure is the same. And, you know, maybe there will be a day where I can just take off for the summer and, and go to Europe. But right now it's, it allows me to, to be flexible with the children and to enjoy the lifestyle that I like. I love that. You, you were picturing having your laptop at the chateau somewhere with your kids running around in this field and handling someone's right. payroll. And, and really, it's from the soccer field, you know, with, with the Absolutely. little umbrella. <laughs> Absolutely. That is, that is true. We go to glamorous places like, you know, interstate side hotel rooms. And although I do have to, I have to, in full disclosure, I did go on a trip last year to Ireland with my daughter to play soccer. So I was able to go and do that for 12 days. And it was um, the end of March, beginning of April. I never would have been able to do that, you know, in a normal job. So That's true. That's true. You know, self-confidence in a good way, I mean, that is definitely one of your gifts. Because I, I'm looking back on this, I'm thinking most people seven years out of the workforce and then going through a divorce, and many people would opt for, I need a steady paycheck, I'm going to get a job somewhere, you know, and, and not the the additional stress for many that comes with starting a business. But, you, I mean, you really believed in yourself and, and got out there and made it happen. But I don't know if that's entirely true. I don't know if that's, totally, if that's totally true. I think that at that point, I just wanted to give it a shot. You know, I just wanted to give it a try. I did not start out thinking... I'm going to build, you know, a four-person accounting firm and it's going to, you know, we're going to have all these great clients across the country. What I thought was, okay, I've got a little money in savings. I will take a shot and spend the next year maybe doing some contract work out of my guest bedroom. And that's literally what I did. I started with one client who was a friend of mine who had a law firm, has still has a law firm, did work with him. And then I just slowly added on more contract work. I was not, my mindset was not an accounting firm. It was just me working for myself. So just kind of got, got some legs under it, got some more clients and then added a person who at that point, the very first employee of Aguilar Accounting worked in my guest bedroom with me. And then by the time we started to add the third person, I was like, this is going to get kind of uncomfortable. Like, where are we going to put her? Is she going to work in the kitchen table, the bathroom, where? So then we got an office and then, that started to look more like a traditional accounting firm. That wasn't how I started out. I mean, I didn't, you know, mortgage the house and say, we're going for it. I just, I just started with baby steps and figured it out along the way. Wow. That is a great story. How does your firm differ now from those early days? Because, for instance, I, I saw you mention some specialties online. How have you morphed the firm over time? At the beginning, we were taking whatever work came in the door. So if you had a restaurant in New Orleans, sure, we would figure out restaurant accounting, which, by the way, I'm sure your audience knows is about one of the hardest kinds of industries that you can work in, notoriously unstable. So we were taking anything. I took tax work. I did a lot of tax work. And I did tax prep for up until about three or four years ago. That was a core part revenue-wise of our business, but I knew that I was spending, like, first of all, I didn't like it very much, even though my master's degree is in taxation. I didn't like it. I didn't like it. I knew that what I really loved was the technology side, was the integrations, was being able to use all these neat tools that were available to help businesses run better. And from January until at least April 15th, but I mean, you guys, it's not, 
when is it ever not tax season? You know, I mean, there are a couple of months where it's not, but I knew that my focus was being pulled onto that and I was missing the chance to do the good work that I wanted to do with small businesses. So we got rid of the tax line. So now we just do strictly, strictly accounting work, monthly accounting work, and we do it in two main industries. One would be law firms. So that is one niche that we started in and have held on to. And the second would be real estate brokerages. Um, so we work with a lot of Loft 47 real estate brokerages. And those, I guess those are our two main service lines, which it sounds like they're not related, but they are, there are a lot of similarities. They have both trust accounting requirements um, and their professional services. So they actually kind of do go nicely together. I know or I understand why you got rid of the tax side I'm curious how difficult it was because I've seen some people struggle with that. You know, they know that, you know, they're building a practice and they know how much effort that takes in such concentrated periods of time. But also they struggle with, you know, the revenue that comes in. Mm -hmm. And, well, if I don't do their taxes, am I going to lose them as clients overall? And and so I'm I'm curious, did you do that in baby steps or did you go cold turkey one year and (laughs) just not do any more tax returns? What was that like? So I would say the first year we decided not to take any new clients and we were just doing current clients. Um, and then the second year I did go cold turkey and I had built a good relationship with a local accounting firm here that was tax heavy and then also have relationships with, with some virtual tax prep firms. So just depending on where the client was and what kind of client it was, I just referred those out to those practices. And literally the next year we did zero tax returns. So it was hard. I mean, it was hard. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, but it's a lot of stress. It's a lot of labor cost. You know, so when we looked at the the margins, I mean, there was, it was certainly a chunk of cash to make up, but at that point it was more important to me to be able to go back and retool the firm that I really wanted to have and be able to start these other businesses that I've started. Okay. Did you make some staffing changes during that time? You said it was very labor intensive, so I was just curious. Yeah, we did, but it was sort of organic. So a couple of things happened at the same time that we rolled out of the tax world. So I had built up this practice to four full-time employees. One was always virtual, but there were three that came to my office. And we had this beautiful office in downtown New Orleans. I mean, it was just, it was probably the nicest office I have ever worked in or will ever work in. It was lovely, but it was pricey. Over about a six-month period, there was just this natural turnover that helped us get back to a a more lean firm. So I had one person who got married and moved away with his wife. I had one person who decided to go back to law school. I had one who decided to take another job for a different reason. And so as these folks started to turn over, I was replacing them with talent, with the skill set that I wanted specifically. So when I, when I started the accounting practice, oh, I wanted an admin assistant, I wanted a, an accountant, and I wanted a bookkeeper. But as I got the chance to replace these people, I didn't look in New Orleans. I looked across the country and said, okay, well, what are the skills I really need now? So this is probably 2015-ish. What are the skills that I really want from my staff now? And they're less about tax prep. They're less about payroll rules. It's more about zero, being skilled in zero being what I call tech curious. So somebody who you can say, here's a new app, figure it out, figure out how it connects to a general ledger. And that didn't really exist in New Orleans. And so I was hiring people from Texas, Utah, and Nebraska. And so when I did that, I no longer had people to, I no longer had staff coming to the office. If I wasn't doing tax work, I no longer really had clients coming to the office. So I ended up getting rid of my office. Now I worked out of my back house. So yeah, I lost a bunch of revenue top line, but we were able to make cuts that it wasn't that significant of a decrease in the bottom line. Interesting. Okay. I definitely want to get to the other ventures you have going on as well. <laughs> Maybe now is a good time. Is it pronounced elephant or elephant? Or Tell us about your training company. <laughs> yeah, elephant. It's elephant. Okay. It's spelled fancy, but it's pronounced simple, elephant. <laughs> so that's, to be honest, it started with an idea that it would be a scheme to be able to travel. <laughs> if I'm completely honest. So as I was building um, the zero side of the firm, you know, in accounting and advisory services off of zero, my best friend from college, who was also an accountant, would come and help me in the practice. And as she was learning about zero, she was like, this is a really cool platform. 
you know, but nobody knows how to use it because it has a huge market share in New, New Zealand and Australia, but still entering the market in the U.S., and there aren't any training resources for zero for small businesses. Small businesses love zero. It's very simple. So um, what if, this is our idea, what if we could come up with a course for small businesses on how to use zero, and we'll just set up these workshops across the country, and we'll get to travel to all the towns we love. <laughs> so <laughs> that was our initial scheme, and that was like, we'll, we'll create these zero workshops and travel across the country. What has happened is that we now don't teach small businesses. We teach accountants and bookkeepers. We do 90% of it virtually and we don't travel. So we've completely changed what we really thought we were going to be, but for the better, honestly, and it's turned into something that is also not just zero specific. We teach QuickBooks Online. We teach how to use apps with general ledgers like Gusto or Receipt Bank, Extensify, Bill.com. So we have a huge base of content that's not zero based anymore. Um, so the initial, and back in, I think it's 2016, um, about Elephant has changed. But the name, I always get asked about the name, like how do you come up with a silly name like Elephant? <laughs> so we were tossing around, obviously, everybody out there, I think, who has started their own business knows the hardest part of starting a business is picking the name. That is the hardest thing, to pick a name. So we're throwing a bunch of things on the wall. We're like, well, what we're trying to address with this skills gap training is one, the elephant in the room for small businesses being finance. It's the thing they hate. They don't want to think about it. They ignore it, right? And also for accounting firms, the thing that they ignore in their practices is technology. We know we need to take care of it, but we're just too busy. We're too busy doing tax returns. We're too busy doing audits. We know we, we're going to get there next year, next year. So the elephant in the room is one of the analogies that we got the name from. And then the other one would be that how do you eat an elephant? You know, how do you accomplish something that's really big and seems overwhelming one bite at a time? So our tagline is better books one bite at a time or better firms one bite at a time. And then we were, we're from South Louisiana, so we're like, we'll just spell it French in the French way, and that'll be fun. Ah. And now nobody knows how to say it. <laughs> so that's how we got elephant, yeah. I love it. Actually, the words were coming out of my mouth one bite at a time. But <laughs> it's yeah. so ingrained. You're, that's a great name. I love it. I love it. I never thought it would be what it is today, but it's so fun. Like when I see on social media or I hear at conferences, people talking about it, not knowing that it's my company, you know, when I hear it come back to me, like, oh, well, this company, Elephant, they're the ones to go to if you want accounting technology training. I'm like, it's so cute that people are, are using Elephant, Elephant, Elephant. It's a silly name, but it's coming back to me and it's fun. Wow. It's catchy. Yeah. People remember it. Wow. That is cool. Is this all pre-recorded training? Or are you doing live webinars or how? What's the, the mode? <laughs> yeah, man, we're doing a lot of things. So we do run live webinar series and we do those in chunks. So we just finished up one after tax season. So we started the end of April and ran to the middle of May where we do a lot of live webinar content and it is CPE qualified. So we do have a license from NASA. So we do issue CPE for those. And then we'll do another one probably mid-summer and we'll do another one after the October 15 deadline. So we do do these, these webinars, but we also do have a lot of pre-recorded content. We are in the process literally right now, I got an email this morning, of rolling out a learning platform that will include some self-paced content. So basically our webinars will be recorded and those will be in a resource library so folks can watch those on demand. The resource library will also include downloads, so charts of accounts and white papers and all kinds of interesting content. So we're doing that as well. And then we do go occasionally on site with firms. So I have a couple of contracts, one big four and one top 50 firm, where occasionally I'll travel to them and do live on site training as well. Interesting. <laughs> and what is Blue Wire strategy? <laughs> that was, that's number yeah, three. So this is number three, if you're counting out there. So Blue Wire is a consulting company that I started with a couple of fellas I met through Zero, And really, it is the white glove consulting coaching service for accounting firms. So where Elephant is more mass market, Blue Wire is direct engagement with firms, specifically around helping them flip to the cloud. So we have engagements with very traditional firms that either have a broad scope where we're going to 
be on site and be their project managers and change agents. And, you know, these are the typical firms who say, we've got to go to the cloud, but we don't know where to start. And then they just get paralyzed by indecision. <laughs> so we go in and we say, here's how you do it. Here's step one. Here's step two. We walk them through a process um, over a couple of months and get them converting clients and moving clients to the cloud. So we do that through BlueRide. And then we also do specific engagements around integration technology. If we have a big client who says, you know, their client might need help with integrating QuickBooks Online and Deer Inventory. So, like, those are two platforms. What's the best practice for integrating that? And can you convert our clients over? So we do have the ability to do very technical conversions around integrations. This is interesting to me. So you have Aguilar Accounting, where you're managing a virtual team that does outsourced accounting to specific niches. And so they're, therefore, you, you are an expert in those areas, and I'm sure looked at as a subject matter expert. Please tell my 15-year-old daughter that I'm an expert in something, please, because she doesn't (laughs) think I know anything. (laughs) Deal, deal. You have a training company where you're providing both live webinar content and you're working on uh, a larger pre-recorded content project, and you've got this white glove consulting company where you're working with some very large clients as well. I'm trying to find where the balance is in all this. How do you manage that? Because I, we, we mentioned that early, and I know you do, but you're doing so much, and it's not all on autopilot. It, it, yeah, let's yeah. talk about that. So it's interesting. I was really giving this a lot of thought because it's the beginning of summer here. You know, my kids were out of school. They've been out of school now one week, and I had a really, really intense May. We did a conference under Elephant called Accounting Salon, um, where we had 36 of the smartest people in cloud accounting come to New Orleans for an intensive for three days. So that was happening. I mentioned we did this pretty big webinar series. I had some training commitments for one of my clients that I had to deliver. So I had a really, really intense May. But looking at the summer, you know, June will be for me a month of focusing on the kids. Both my kids are in competitive sports. And so they're doing a lot of training over the summer. So on the work front, and I have to say, I have great staff. Like this is, I'm not sitting here doing all this stuff myself. I have awesome staff that take care of a lot of what needs to be done. But I'll spend June, rather than doing on-site training or the stuff that is energy zapping, I'll do more, more writing. I'll build out some of this content for the learning system. And I'll spend time with my kids, basically running them around town. I don't touch every important thing every day. You know, like I really do try every week. I say, okay, what are three things? Where are three things I'm going to move the ball for the week? And that could be work, but it could be personal too. So I I just try and take it in chunks. And one thing that comes, I think, with age and experience. So I've been a CPA for 20 years. I'm 43. One thing that comes with age and experience is that you realize things aren't going to fall apart in a week or even a month. Do the best that you can, and you try to move the ball in baby step each chance you get. And at some point, you look back, and I look back to 2012 when I was getting divorced and scared and did not know what my life was going to be like. I look back, and I think, man, it's been a slow road, but we've really gotten to something that I've gotten a place where, where I'm very proud of what I've got and what I've done. You know, you're echoing something that's come across on the podcast before. So, so many people think of balance as I'm spending an equal amount of time or I'm on a daily basis almost at work versus with family. You know, I'm keeping it literally yeah. in balance. And really, I think it's more what you're saying and, and what others have said is that it's more, you know, sometimes you are spending a little more time at work and because there's a special project, but then it flips later on and, and you're spending more time in personal activities or, or activities that refresh you, you know, like the Yeah, creative. absolutely. So I give a talk called CPA CEO Mom, a transparent talk about having it all. And I've done this as a webinar before and I will be doing it at Accountex in September. But one of the core pieces of that talk is you have to, it's not specifically for women, but it probably is specifically for parents. Like you have to take time to do those things that make you deeply happy, like deeply happy. And I'm talking about not just 
superficially happy, but like, what are your core values? What is really important to you? So for me, the two things are very important to me, being in nature and cooking for my family, like providing nutritious meals for my family. Those are things that make me deeply happy. So I try to do some of that every single day because that refills my cup. That makes me a better mom. It makes me a better advisor. It makes me a better boss. And, you know, maybe I don't get to it every single day, but I constantly am aiming to spend time in those areas. Now, realistically, there are only so many hours in a day. So I have tried to cut out the junk, um, the stuff that is not soul filling, that is not deeply aligned with my values, which a lot of times is social media and getting on this infinite scroll of, oh, well, there are other quote unquote advisors or coaches to firms out there. And look at this ad they're running on Facebook. And why don't I have a girlfriend in a bikini. Why can't that be me? You know, and that gets completely distracting and starts to eat at you. So I've made it, especially in the last year, really made an effort to ignore that and know I'm just going to do good work. I'm going to do good work for my clients. I'm going to do good work for my firm clients. I'm going to do good work for my children and wake up the next morning and start over. There you go. Well, I end every podcast with the same three questions and and I do want to get to those, but Given that we're having this discussion, I'm curious, what does success look like for you going forward? You've got three businesses. Family is obviously extremely important. Are they all growing in the same direction, or what do you foresee in the future for yourself? I've got to get my kids out of high school successfully and get to college. (laughs) It's looking good right now, but you never know. It's looking good. They're turning out to be funny, smart, kind people, so I feel like that's going in the right direction. The business stuff, I probably will at some point end up rolling off of the accounting practice. And I say that like kind of gritting my teeth because I think what makes me a better trainer than others um, is that I, I do still have my foot in my practice, right? So I still am using zero. I'm using apps every single day. And I think that makes me a better trainer. So I hesitate to say that, but realistically, in order to do the work, I think is my purpose. I probably have to roll up the accounting practice and spend more time in the training and consulting area. And for me, success in that is helping other accountants and bookkeepers build the practices that they love. Like that's our tagline or our mission or vision statement at Elephant is founded with a sense of adventure. Elephant helps accountants and bookkeepers leverage technology to build the practices of their dreams. And so that's very important to me because I was able to do that. I was able to, as a nearly single, confused, scared mother build a practice. And I could not have done that without technology. Now, there are other thousands of other single parents for whom, you know, that's their dream. But there are also thousands of accountants and bookkeepers who want to have a million dollar practice, you know, who want to scale, who want to grow, who want to run um, huge firms. And that's their dream practice. And so at Elephant, we want to help those people build their dreams as well. So I think Success looks like that, like, a, like touching as many accountants and bookkeepers and helping them do good, meaningful work, making a good living, and having the lives that they want as well. Wonderful. You've definitely put some thought into it. I can tell you're passionate about that part. I am. I really am. I really am. Well, the final three questions I end every podcast with, the first one is, from a career perspective, what's been your proudest moment? So I was thinking about this, and this was kind of hard <laughs> to think, like, well, is it, you know, is it this recognition or is it this thing, this award? But honestly, when I think about this thing that I, like, almost overwhelms me with emotion career-wise, it would probably be creating and building the accounting salon. So I had this idea a couple of years ago. For those of us who go to conferences to speak, you know, account tax or QuickBooks Connect or scaling or ZeroCon. For those of us who are regarded as experts in the space, I hate to say that because I hate using that word, but those of us who, I guess, really embrace cloud accounting, there wasn't a good forum for us to get information from. So a lot of those conferences, I hate to say it, but are, are sponsored. The sessions, the content is sponsored by apps or by vendors, and it tends to be, frankly, stale. My thought was, what if we could get all these folks who are really, really smart and just pull them into a room and talk for a couple of days about what's going on in the cloud accounting industry? Like kind of what would happen naturally at the conferences is after the sessions were over, folks would gravitate to the hotel bar 
and they'd say, well, have you tried this app? And I really like this thing. And do you know so-and-so? And you guys need to meet, and let's make all these connections. What if we could just skip the first part and get to that good stuff? And so I had this idea to create a cross-platform salon, a salon in the spirit of a French salon of the 1700s, where everyone comes in, everyone is an equal. There's, it's not a presentation of information as much as sharing and a debate even about things. So what if we put 36 really, really smart people in a room and did that? So like this is where I get overwhelmed because I threw this out as, a, as an idea, as an invitation. You know, can we get who I think are the really brightest people to come? And they did. So we did this in the beginning of May, and we had folks like Jeannie Whitehouse, Juliet Aurora, Brittany Brown, Michael Lee on the what I call the QuickBooks side, because my background is mostly zero. I know lots of cool zero people, but QuickBooks, not so much. And why would they have so much faith in me? They don't know me to come down to New Orleans and, and talk about cloud accounting, but they did. And then um, on the zero side, we had folks like Kenji Karamoto, Liz Mason, even Heather Smith. She came from Australia to come up to accounting salon. So when I talk, when I think about like my proudest moment, it was probably sitting in that room in May and looking around the room and saying, man, this is like the brain trust of cloud accounting that they had faith to come and sit and share and be completely vulnerable and completely honest. That is something I'm very, very proud of. I'm curious, is there a presenter for each topic or is this, is this a bunch of roundtables and let's just get together and talk? It's kind of a mix. So what happens is we, when we invite folks to come to Accounting Salon, which if anybody would like to be nominated, they can self-nominate at accountingsalon.com. When we pull the list together of, of who would, will be attending, I do a survey and I have some ideas about the content I want to talk about. Like one thing we talked about in May was, is advisory dead? Because, because advisory is the answer to everything. It's the band-aid for everything right now. Like, oh, you don't want to do tax work? Go do advisory. You think QuickBooks Live is going to take all your clients? Don't worry about it. Just go do advisory. So we did have a, a panel discussion about is advisory the answer to everything because that's what people are telling us. So I kind of coordinate the content to a certain degree based on who's coming. And there are presentations. Sometimes they're a panel of four. Sometimes it's a partnership of two. Sometimes it's one person. But then we do do a lot of roundtable discussion as well. And we talk about all kinds of things. Last year, we talked about mid-market, like how small firms can start to move mid-market and how that line is starting to sort of overlap between small and mid-market advisory or accounting work. We talked this year about compensation models for firm employees that are more aligned with the fee structure we're all talking about needing to adopt, right? So why are we paying folks hourly if we're not billing hourly anymore? And so some alternates to that. So it's pretty cool high-level stuff. But yeah, I kind of orchestrate it, but it kind of comes out of the group as well. Interesting. I'm getting views of like a TED Talk. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it kind of is. It's kind of like two days of TED Talks, but sometimes with more than one person, which is fun. It is fun. Well, second question, tell us about a mistake you've made and what you learned from it, because really that's what we're after. But the more open and transparent and bigger colossal mistakes you can <laughs> give us, the better. <laughs> I think probably the biggest mistake, well, a, a couple, which I've already talked to, is like starting a business and thinking it's going to look like one thing and being 100% certain it's going to be this. And then you look back three years later and you're like, it looks nothing like this. So on elephant side, thinking that we are going to teach small business owners how to use zero in hotel ballrooms. <laughs> that was a pretty big mistake. It turned out fine, right? We changed course on that for the better, but it did definitely teach us a bit about the logistics and scalability of running a business. So we thought we were going to literally travel across the country. That's totally impractical. And on the accounting firm side too, thinking, you know, I want these kinds of niche clients. And I see this all the time, especially in bookkeeper groups on social media, and you may have as well, where somebody decides they're going to be a bookkeeper. And so they do the courses and then they're told, now go pick your niche. You have to have a niche to practice. Go pick it right now. How are you supposed to know on day one of being a bookkeeper, what industry is the right fit for you? How are you supposed to know that? I mean, I couldn't do it with, with almost 20 years of experience. I thought, you know, maybe I'd take some restaurants and maybe I'd, I don't know, take retail stores or e-commerce. I mean, that's nothing, really not what we do at all anymore. How can a brand new bookkeeper go out and pick a, a niche with no experience? It doesn't work that way. So 
Um, so I'd say those are two of my three companies were started under bad assumptions. <laughs> when you're starting, you, you sort of have to see what works and <laughs> before you, you pick a niche. That's, yeah. And look, you know, two years from now, Elephant could look totally different. It could look completely different. I don't, I don't know, but it could. I have to just be open to that. Definitely. Well, last question, and then we'll go ahead and close it down. What is the best piece of advice that you have ever received? So I think probably not sweating the small stuff and slowing down and paying attention. We've talked about for the last 45 minutes, you know, my entire career right now was predicated on me raising two children. And that happened in about five minutes. They're both teenagers now. They're both in high school. Frankly, they will be out of the house shortly. And I look back at these years and think, I wish I had spent more time. And I think all parents go through this, but probably especially entrepreneur parents. I think, man, I wish I would just slow down a little bit. Like the stuff that seems important at the time, is really not always that important. So I'm trying to do that in practice and I am more now, but listening to that advice that someone gave me a long time ago, the, the days are long, but the years are short. Like just keeping that in mind and really paying attention to what's going on every single minute. Perfect. That wraps it up very well. Definitely. Well, for our audience, this has been Life in Accounting. We are a podcast production of whereaccountantsgo.com. If you haven't yet come over to the website, please do so. We're going to have the show notes for Amanda's episode, plus all our other episodes as well. And we have an extraordinary amount of career-related advice for accountants also. Once again, that is www.whereaccountantsgo.com. Well, Amanda, this really has been a fun conversation. As we talked about prior to starting the recording, I learned a lot. You were right. (laughs) You have had an amazing career. It it was a really, really fun conversation. If people want to find out more about you or or your businesses, what's the best way or, or sort of preferred way to get in touch with you? If you want to reach out directly, the easiest would be to email me, Amanda, at elephanttraining.com, which is E-L-E-F-A-N-T training.com. If anybody out there, again, would like to self-nominate for Accounting Swan, please do that, accountingswan.com. And then, like most of all of your guests, I'm pretty easy to find on Twitter and Facebook as well. Beautiful. Well, thank you for taking the time to join us, and thank you to the audience as well for joining us. We will see everyone next week. There's more to come.